Hello, and thank you for tuning into our program today. My name is William Stewart. I'd like to encourage you to open up your Bible and follow along as we study. We're going to take our lesson for today from Matthew, the fifth chapter, at verse 17 through to verse 20. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 through verse 20. There Jesus says, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy but to fulfill. For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Friend, I believe that there's a great deal in the section of text that we had read which would have confounded the Jewish mind as they listened to Jesus. I didn't come to destroy the law and the prophets, but to fulfill it. They would be curious, what does he mean by that? And through the next few years of his teaching, some of them would come to understand what he meant by that. Till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Again, so many would wonder, what is he saying by that? What does that mean that, that not one jot or tittle will pass from the law until all is fulfilled? And they would see through his teaching again in the coming years what he meant. He goes on to talk about those who break the commandments, the least of the commandments, and teach men to do so also, and how they will be humbled among God's people. But whoever does the commandments of God, he says, will be exalted. This one will be great in the kingdom of heaven. But the portion of the text that I want us to focus on in particular is verse 20. That had to be a shocking statement for the listeners of Jesus to hear on that occasion. I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus has just told his audience that you need to be more righteous, that your righteousness needs to go beyond, surpass, excel the righteousness of your religious leaders. That had to be a shock to hear. Because our religious leaders, are they not the most righteous among us? Uh, are they not the closest to God of all people? And this man saying that we need to be more righteous than they are? As Jesus would continue his teaching through his ministry of three years, he would demonstrate to the people time and again how the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes were not righteous individuals. The greatest of those texts is likely Matthew 23, where Jesus goes up one side of them and down the other. Not in order to be cruel, but in order to demonstrate to them and to those who followed them that they were hypocrites, that they were not righteous at all. And so let's go over to Matthew 23, and I want us to spend the greater portion of our time today looking at some of the things that Jesus says about the scribes and the Pharisees in Matthew, the 23rd chapter. The first three verses there, he says, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to do, that do. But do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. Very simply, Jesus has said that they are very good theorists. 
but they're very poor practitioners. They know what the law says. They sit in Moses' seat. They sit in a place of authority where they have the law. And they disseminate the law. But they fail to practice the law. We must put the things of the Lord into practice. For us to know what God's word says and then not do anything about it does us no good. In Matthew 7, at verse 21 and 22, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Have we not prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Jesus says we must do the will of the Father. In James chapter 1 at verse 22 and 23, James says, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in the mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. The picture is almost that of uh, an individual who looks in the mirror and notices that his face is covered in dirt. But then he turns away from it and forgets that he's got a dirty face. We need to look into the perfect law of liberty and do what it says. Be a doer of the word of God. We can't be good theorists when it comes to God's word. We need to put into practice what God has said. In James chapter 2 and at verse 20, James makes the statement, Do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? If all we have is a head knowledge and an emotional response to the will of God, but we don't actually put it into practice, our faith is useless. The Pharisees... And the scribes, Jesus reveals, as good theorists, but poor practitioners. Back to Matthew 23, look at verse 4. He says, For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. They bound burdens on others that they would not bear themselves. Now, Among those burdens that they were binding, they were binding their own laws, not just what the Lord said. Sometimes they'd actually take away what the Lord said and bind something else on the people. But friend, we need to be bound by nothing more or less than what God says, and all of us are required to do it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, at verse 24, beginning, the Apostle Paul says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. When you hear the Apostle Paul saying, this is something you need to do, do you know what? He's doing it himself. And that's how it ought to be with religious leaders. They ought not be those who very freely tell other people what they need to do, but they're failing to do it themselves. That was the nature of the Pharisees and the scribes. They would bind heavy burdens, hard to bear on others, but they themselves would not move them even with one finger. Again in Matthew 23 and at verse 5 now, he says, But all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments, They love the best places at feasts and the best seats in the synagogue, greetings in the marketplaces, and to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But you do not be called Rabbi, for one is your teacher, the Christ, and you are not all brethren. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. And do not be called teachers, for one is your teacher, the Christ." 
But he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. As Jesus considered the righteousness of the Pharisees and the scribes, he noted them as a group of people who did their righteous deeds so that they might be seen by men. They love the attention that you give them. They love to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad, their garments, or the borders of their garments large. They love those good seats that where they're prominent uh, in the public eye. They love the attention. They love to be called rabbi and teacher and father. All these things stroke their ego. In Matthew chapter 5 and at verse 16, Jesus tells us where the glory should go when we do that which is good. He says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. In chapter 6 and at verse 1 beginning, Jesus says, Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have the glory of men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing that your charitable deed may be done in secret, and that your Father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. Friend, when we're going to do what is good and right and just in the eye of God, let's make sure that we're doing it before God, not before men. The scribes and the Pharisees were interested in the honor of men, not the honor of God. And so we need to not follow in that type of example. Again, in Matthew 23, this time at verse 13, But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. One would think that they were leading people into the kingdom of heaven. Of course, they're religious leaders. Well, what else would they be doing? But because they were false religious leaders, because they taught their own doctrines instead of the doctrine of God, they were in fact shutting up the kingdom of heaven to people. They themselves wouldn't go in because they didn't teach the will of God. They taught their own will. But then they were leading others astray as well and causing others to not enter the kingdom of God. We need to be sure that we're entering the kingdom of God ourselves, and then we lead others in as well. When the apostles came and preached the gospel message, these were men who had entered the kingdom of God themselves and sought to bring others with them. When Paul wrote to Timothy, he cautioned him that he needed to take heed to himself and to the doctrine, to continue in them, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. It was essential that Timothy teach the right doctrine and lead people in the right way so that they might enter the kingdom of God. Again, let's go back to Matthew 23, and this time down to verse 23. Matthew 23, verse 23. It says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithes of mint and anise and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. The scribes and the Pharisees, of whom Jesus said to the people, you must be more righteous than they are, were individuals who gave great attention to detail, but 
omitted the greater part or the weightier matters. We need to be sure that we give attention to both. Notice Jesus says that you ought to have done these. It was right for them to pay attention to the details, to the small things. But also, make sure that you're doing everything and those big items as well. You've left alone the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These huge parts of God's will, they just left them aside. It wasn't all that important. But focused on the little things. Verse 24 very aptly characterizes it, that they strain out a gnat but swallow a camel. We need to give attention to the weighty matters of the law and to the small matters of the law of God. In Matthew chapter 5 and at verse 19, Jesus says, Whoever breaks therefore one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. The Lord wants us to pay attention to all the will of God, not just a portion, not just a bit here and there, but everything that God has revealed. The scribes and the Pharisees did not do so. Again in Matthew 23, and we'll pick up at verse 25, he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisees first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Jesus reveals that the religious leaders of the day were scrupulous to avoid outward sins, things which would be blatantly seen by people and, and obvious that, oh, wow, he's not really what, he, what, what I saw he was. They'd avoid those things, but Jesus says, you're corrupt inside. That you've washed the outside. Everything looks good on the outside, but inside you're full of dead men's bones. Inside you're you're filthy. You're disgusting. What would you think if I invited you into my home for a cup of tea or a cup of coffee and... I grabbed a cup that was up in my cupboard and brought it and and laid it down in front of you before I poured your coffee in. And the outside of it, as I'm bringing it to you, is just glistening. It looks like a wonderful cup. But then, as I've set it down in front of you, you peer inside it and, ooh, it's got a stench to it as well. Do you really want to have a coffee from that cup? Well, that's the picture that Jesus is painting of the religious leaders in his day. That outwardly they look beautiful, they look wonderful, they look religious, but inside they're corrupt, they're dirty, they're filthy, and they're irreligious. We need to avoid sins of the heart. We need to be a people who are interested in keeping the word of God from the heart, keeping our hearts pure, In Hebrews chapter 4 and at verse 12, we're told that the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. God's word is going to reveal our heart, whether we're doing what we're doing because we love God and want to be faithful, or whether we have some ulterior motive. God's word is a discerner of the heart. Back in Jeremiah's prophecy, Jeremiah 4 and at verse 14, it says, O Jerusalem, wash your heart from wickedness, that you may be saved. How long shall your evil thoughts lodge within you? 
God wants us to be cleansed of wickedness. He wants us to purge the wickedness and the evil from our hearts. In James chapter 4 and at verse 8, James simply says, Draw near to God and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. The Lord does not want us to be double-minded people. Serving Him outwardly because it looks good and receives the praise of men, but inwardly serving ourselves and having all manner of wickedness. We need to avoid sins of the heart. Finally, let's go over to Luke chapter 18. In Luke 18, Jesus teaches a parable wherein a Pharisee and a tax collector both come to pray before God. He says at verse 10, Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. One last thing I want us to notice about the righteousness of the Pharisees is that it was self-righteousness. This Pharisee, as he came before God to pray, notice what Jesus said at verse 11. He prayed thus with himself. It wasn't about God. It was about him. And as he prayed, he said, I thank you that I'm not like other people. I thank you that I am righteous in his self-righteousness. And he was so bold as to even mention another man who was there praying before God. Lord, I thank you I'm not like him. Well, Jesus said that that other man whom he was glad he was not like is the one who walked away justified because he acknowledged his sin and asked for mercy. The Pharisee did not even acknowledge that he had sinned. He was righteous in his own eyes and did not need a Savior. We need to take care of ourselves and make sure that we are righteous before God. Not self-righteous, but righteous by keeping the commandments of God. And when we've done so, then we're in a position to help others. That's the message that Jesus gives in Matthew 7 and beginning at verse 1 where he says, Judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged, and with what measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye and do not consider that there is a plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, Let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Really what Jesus is revealing is that the Pharisees and the scribes had no business teaching others about the kingdom of God because they themselves were not ready for it. Friend, we need to take care of our own lives. And as we do so, as we saw when Paul was writing to Timothy, he told him to take heed to himself and to the doctrine, for in doing so he would save others and himself. We need to take heed to ourselves and the doctrine. Unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of God. Friend, I wonder if there's some application of that for today when it comes to the religious leaders of today, that perhaps our righteousness needs to exceed theirs. Maybe they're not teaching what they ought to teach. Maybe they, like the Pharisees, 
have bound burdens that God does not mind or loosed things which God has not loosed. Perhaps they do righteous deeds to be seen by men. We ought not follow in that example. Maybe they've shut up the kingdom of heaven by teaching as commandments the doctrines of men and setting aside the will of God for their traditions. Friend, we need to be cautious today. There are still some in the world who, like the Pharisees and the scribes, consider themselves righteous, but it is self-righteousness that they have. Friend, if we can help you in studying God's Word, we'd love to do so. We could supply you with a free Bible correspondence course if you want to request one, or a home Bible study. Or we would be happy for you to come and assemble with us if you have opportunity this week to do so. We thank you for your good attention today. We encourage you to tune in again next week. Until then, have a great day and a good week.